Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. The biggest story of the week was undoubtedly another always excitement guaranteeing Starship integrated flight test on Thursday, Flight 8, even if it did come to an eerily similar end to Flight Test 7. Ariane 6 made its commercial debut on the same day to roaring success though, China deployed a military satellite to geosynchronous Earth orbit, and Intuitive Machines' latest moon lander ended up sideways again. All of this and so much more, including continuation of Elon's narrative that Biden prevented Butch and Sonny from returning from the ISS. <sighs> well anyway, let's start off with Starship. So Thursday was the big day. Disappointingly, of course. Last Monday's episode of Space This Week was delayed to the Tuesday, so I could talk about it fresh off the launch, but sadly things were scrubbed due to there being too many questions about the flight, and then systems were 20 bar low on ground spin startup pressure, according to Elon. SpaceX there taking a precautionary approach to things, no doubt because of Flight 7's disastrous end. To ensure it would definitely fare better than its predecessor, SpaceX made a number of upgrades to Ship 34, as well as put it through the longest ever static fire burn of a ship, lasting 58 seconds on the 11th of February. In SpaceX's words, this static fire tested multiple engine thrust levels and three separate hardware configurations in the Raptor vacuum engine feed lines to recreate and address the harmonic response seen during Flight 7. Findings from the static fire were used to enact hardware changes to the fuel feed lines, to the vacuum wrapped engines, adjustments to propellant temperatures, and a new operating thrust target for Flight 8. So optimism was high for Flight 8. After all, Flight 4, 5 and 6 all went extremely well, with the ship surviving re-entry and performing controlled splashdowns in the ocean, so hopefully whatever blip happened with Ship 33 would be an isolated incident. And it was sort of. <laughs> we witnessed the Starship's super heavy full stack fuel up and the countdown made it all the way to zero with engine ignition and liftoff of the vehicle. After this, things proceeded well with nominal throttle down for max Q during ascent and super heavy Miko, that's most engines cut off in this context, at plus two minutes 32 and successful Starship engine ignition and hot staging eight seconds later. Followed by this, we saw a partial failure during super heavy's boost back burn with only 11 of the 13 engines igniting. That being said, things were go for catch, with successful boost back burn shutdown and hot stage jettison. The landing burn experienced failure of one of the 13 engines to relight, but that didn't prevent it from successfully landing in the jaws of the chopsticks, something that still never gets old, wrapping up three for three for super heavy catch attempts. So far, it's a 100% success rate, at least for actual catch attempts. We did have an aborted catch attempt during flight six, with the booster instead diverting to the Gulf of Mexico. However, the successful catch of Super Heavy was the end of Flight 8's successes. Ship 34 continued its ascent burn nominally at first, but four engines steadily failed from the plus 8 minute 4 second mark, which was only around 30 seconds before the planned second engine cutoff point, tragically. <laughs> the asymmetric thrust sent the vehicle into a spin, reminiscent of Flight 3's re-entry, as one vacuum raptor and the sea level raptors gradually shut down. I'm seriously surprised at just how long the other engines continued firing after the first cutoff. You'd think that the flight computer would issue immediate engine shutdown of at least the other two vacuum raptors, no? The ship continued tumbling for quite some time actually, before telemetry data was finally lost, which was probably the moment that the flight termination system blew the ship apart. The destruction and breakup of the vehicle was seen from the Bahamas, Florida, Jamaica, and the Turks and Caicos Islands. And for those familiar with Flight 7, these shots look eerily similar to the breakup and re-entry of Ship 33. And of course, this marks both the second flight of a Block 2 vehicle and the second failure of a Block 2 vehicle. Now, truthfully, thanks to my celebrity status, I often receive some leaked shots and things from the Starship program, as do a lot of influencers, but I never share these because even with the advent of Star Factory, Starship's development remains one of the most open aerospace projects out there. The level of access we have to this program is unprecedented, and I never want SpaceX to start clamping down on this. However, this leak has been shared over 1 million times on Twitter, and it's hit the front page of Reddit and several news outlets have shared it, so I feel comfortable in saying that the cat is out of the bag, so I'm gonna share it here too. It's a shot shortly before loss of the ship, showing, alarmingly, an apparent complete loss of one of the Vacuum Raptor engines. This either indicates the engine completely blew apart, but I prefer the idea that it simply fell off, 
just that it could become Starship's first ever deployed payload. <laughs> but looping back to earlier, it's kind of crazy that the other engines are still firing here, despite one of them being completely absent. What does this mean for Flight 9, do you think? We were obviously all hopeful that Flight 8's success would mean that Flight 9 would be the first to go orbital and would be the first to perform a Starship catch, or at the very least, a Starship splashdown in close proximity to Starbase. But that's almost certainly not going to be the case now. Just like with Flight 8, it'll be relegated to re-attempting the mission profile of the failed flight that came before it. While we all know that Starship is being developed in an unprecedented way, so failures should be expected more than a regular rocket that spends years on paper before any hardware is built, it's still pretty mad that eight flights in, we're seeing failures of this magnitude, especially considering that previous flights of the Block 1 ship were completely successful, and multiple previous flights also saw zero engine relight failures of Super Heavy during boost backburn and catch. All that being said, Ship 34 was pretty much completely finished before the loss of Ship 33, so perhaps it was just too late to enact the very deep and serious changes to it based on the data from Flight 7. But who knows, I would love to hear your thoughts on this mission's outcome in the comments down below. Flight 9 Starship is currently ramping up for cryo-testing, prior to having its engines installed. I wonder if SpaceX will make any major changes to this vehicle in light of Flight 8, potentially as extreme as completely overhauling the engine plumbing. Unlikely, considering that it'd probably be easier just to build a new ship from scratch, but a lot of theories are flying around regarding that the Block 2 Starship issues may be stemming from the methane downcomer rupturing, causing leakage of highly flammable gas into the attic and depriving the engines of generative cooling, leading to overheating, fires, and loss of engines and eventually the ship. One sign that SpaceX might not be too worried about the downcomer at this stage is the fact that they installed the downcomer on Ship 36 last week, or at least were seen preparing for install, rather than holding off until the data from Flight 8 can be further analysed. Ultimately, I think this is going to be a case of wait until SpaceX release an official statement when it comes to what exactly went wrong with Ship 34. While it's a shame that Starship failed on its eighth flight test, we did see a successful launch of Ariane 6's first commercial mission just a few hours earlier. This was Ariane 6's second ever mission. While the first mission was broadly successful, certainly more so than the first outing of Ariane 5, which, as you can see, was, well, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't completely without fault. The rocket carried a mass simulator payload, along with a number of small CubeSats and other experiments as rideshare payloads. All of these were deployed successfully following the second burn of the rocket's upper stage. However, the upper stage attempted a third burn to deorbit and destroy itself, but its auxiliary propulsion system failed, preventing the upper stage from relighting. Last week, though, things were different. Ariane 6 lifted off from the French Guiana, carrying a reconnaissance satellite for the French military. So of course, not too much has been disclosed about this satellite. That being said, we know its target orbit was sun-synchronous low Earth orbit, and following two successful burns of the upper stage of Ariane 6, the satellite was deployed. Following this, the Vinci engine of the upper stage successfully completed a third burn to re-enter the atmosphere, which is where the previous flight failed. Here's hoping that the issue with the maiden flight is definitely fixed now, and won't happen again on all future missions. Even though it was all for naught in the end, last week's episode of Space This Week was published on Tuesday, so I could cover the Monday launch of Starship Flight 8, which of course ended up being delayed to the 6th of March. This means that I've already talked about last Monday's Falcon 9 Starlink mission in the previous video, but to very quickly summarise it again here, it was a successful launch of 21 Starlink satellites from Cape Canaveral, but while the first stage booster successfully landed on the Just Read the Instructions drone ship in the Atlantic, an off-nominal fire in the aft end of the rocket damaged the landing leg, causing it to tip over and becoming disassembled. Note here that we don't have a video of this, so on screen is a much earlier Falcon 9 booster meeting a similar end. A couple of weeks ago, I made a video covering the bizarre Twitter statements made by Elon regarding Biden apparently stranding Butch and Sonny on the ISS for political reasons, followed by the absolutely classless arguments and insults he threw at various ISS veteran astronauts, including Andreas Mogensen, who correctly identified that the statement that Butch and Sonny were only left in space because of politics as a lie, and that it's especially disappointing for such a statement to come from a man who is constantly complaining about dishonesty in mainstream media and we all know about the tantrum from Musk that ensued. Well, last week, apparently everyone was throwing around a gotcha because of an Ars Technica headline asserting that Butch Wilmore stated Elon Musk is absolutely factual on Dragon's delayed return. 
But if you read the article, which apparently no one on Twitter did, this is not the case at all, at least in the context of Biden choosing to not bring the duo back because of political reasons. Which for a moment, what does that even mean? Like, what would be a political reason for not wanting to bring the astronauts home? And why would Biden purposefully want to not rescue them? Surely a big win like that during his tenure would be a big win for his political party. Anyway, to keep things on track, I will now talk about that Ars Technica article and go through exactly what the headline referred to. The whole article was a summation of a Q&A between reporters on Earth and ISS astronauts Butch Wilmore, Sonny Williams and Nick Hague. The key question regarding this particular subject started with this one. Did politics influence NASA's decision for you to stay longer in space? To which Butch Wilmore answered, from my standpoint, politics is not playing into this at all. From our standpoint, I think that they would agree. We came up prepared to stay long, even though we plan to stay short. That's what we do in human spaceflight. That's what your nation's human spaceflight program is all about. Planning for unknown, unexpected contingencies. And we did that. And that's why we flowed right into Crew 9, into Expedition 72, as we did. And it was somewhat of a seamless transition, because we had planned for it, and we were prepared. The quote from the headline, though, came from Butch Wilmore's answer to the question, Elon Musk said he made an offer to bring Butch and Sonny home last year, but it was denied by the White House. Is this true? And he said, I can only say that Mr. Musk, what he says, is absolutely factual. So that's the headline there. But he then went on to say, we have no information on that, though, whatsoever. What was offered, what was not offered, who it was offered to, how that process went, that's information that we simply don't have. So I believe him. So there you go, this is more Butch trusting Elon rather than having extra information that proves Elon's weird tweeting that politics left them in space and earlier in the Q&A he flat out said that politics didn't play into it at all. So this is more of an engagement baiting headline rather than a truthful reflection of Butch or Sonny's position on this. What did play into their extended stay wasn't politics, it was common sense and technical planning. And Ars Technica did somewhat redeem that previous headline with another article, covering a media teleconference last Friday from Ken Bowersox, Associate NASA Administrator and Space Operations Mission Directorate, and Steve Stitch, Manager of NASA's Commercial Crew Program, which of course handles Starliner and Crew Dragon missions. A quick rundown of the history here. On the 14th of July last year, NASA awarded SpaceX the contract to examine the options to bring Butch and Sonny home, which essentially came down to either shifting them to Crew 9 and launching the Crew 9 Dragon with two empty seats for them to return on, or send up an entirely separate Dragon with the sole purpose of bringing them home sooner. In the teleconference, Bowersock stated that the option of bringing a capsule home early or conducting a separate Dragon mission was quickly ruled out due to A, budgetary reasons, so not political ones, and more crucially, B, keeping a topped up crew roster on the ISS is crucial in maintaining the orbital laboratory. And so the decision was made to launch Crew 9 with just two astronauts, with Butch and Sonny to remain on the station, and then join that crew for a full six month rotation on the station, with Sonny taking up the role of commander. And again, this was due to reasons of budget, flight scheduling, and most importantly, assessing the space station's needs. Bowersox confirmed that while yes, a return last year would have been possible, the decision to keep them on board to serve under the Crew 9 mission made the most sense, and it was made at the programmatic level. During the conference, Vice President at SpaceX Bill Gerstenmaier was unable to give a substantive answer to what Elon could have been referring to when mentioning Biden and political reasons. Instead, he simply said that SpaceX were willing to support in any manner NASA thought was the right way to support. NASA came up with the option you heard described today, and we're supporting that. So no, Elon was not suddenly proven right either by Butch, Sonny, or the teleconference from NASA. And while we're on the subject of his weird rants about the ISS needing to be deorbited as soon as possible, during that astronaut Q&A, Sonny Williams responded to a question asking if they agreed with Elon's suggestions. She said that Butch and herself have been part of the ISS since its beginning, seeing it grow from just a couple of modules to the amazing laboratory that it is today. And right now, she's been really impressed to see how much science is going on right now, and the current resupply missions are bringing up a good stream of more science. She felt that the ISS was in its prime right now, and that the place is really ticking. It's got all the power, all the facilities up and operating, so right now isn't the time to just call it quits, concluding that we should make the most of this space station for our taxpayers and for all our international partners and hold our obligations and do that world-class science that this laboratory is capable of. 
Now, I did get a lot of comments on my last video on this subject, asserting that since Starship has a space station sized payload capacity, we can just ditch the ISS and just use Starship instead. Yeah, how's that, how's that going? <laughs> Let's wait until it actually works before writing off what we already have, and that goes for all the other space stations being developed. They're just that, being developed. The ISS should not be deorbited until we have a replacement in place. Because, again, the ISS does actual science up there that can't be done on Earth. Science that benefits us all, and will benefit us when we want to go further into space to the Moon and Mars. Which is what Elon wants, no? Maybe, dare I say, He's saying all of this for political reasons. <laughs> okay, on Sunday, we saw a Long March 3BE carry the TJS-15 satellites to geosynchronous Earth orbit. The Chinese TJS satellite series is part of China's military satellite program, and they all operate in geosynchronous orbit. Although the exact nature of these satellites is classified, it's generally thought that these satellites provide early warning and signals intelligence for the Chinese army. Last week, I covered the Falcon 9 launch that carried Intuitive Machines' IM-2 Athena Lunar Lander, carrying several scientific payloads with the primary objective of the mission to test for water ice at the lunar south pole near Shackleton Crater using NASA's Polar Resources Ice Mining Experiment 1, which consists of a drill and a mass spectrometer. Also on board was a miniature rover called Astro Ant, developed by MIT, and a small lunar hopper that would explore permanently shaded regions of the moon, developed by Intuitive Machines. All of this is to say that last week on the 6th of March, the lander made its lunar landing attempt, reaching the surface at 1728 UTC, but with loss of contact with the lander during the landing. By the time contact was re-established, it was found that it was on its side, similar to what happened during Intuitive Machines' previous moon lander attempts. Due to its tipped over position, one of its two radio antennas couldn't operate and the spacecraft couldn't generate sufficient power. By the following day, the lander had fully depleted its electrical supply and the mission came to an end. Intuitive Machines did state that the lander was able to perform a limited amount of scientific experiments. How limited, we'll have to wait and see. After 434 days in space, the secretive Boeing X-37B spacecraft returned to Earth last week, following its launch in December 2023 aboard Falcon Heavy. The footage on screen wasn't this specific landing event though, in fact, the landing this time wasn't even publicly announced until several hours after it happened. The X-37B is a rather mysterious vehicle that carries no crew, just classified military experiments. All we know is that on this particular flight, it carried a NASA experiment to gauge the effects of radiation on materials, but we don't know anything else. I wonder what else it was doing up there for over a year. Laon Aerospace's CEO, me, addressed an ongoing community rumour about whether or not I was paid to play Kerbal Space Program 2 by Take-Two Interactive last week, as well as share some behind-the-scenes stories about what it was like to be a Kerbal Space Program content creator during KSP2's announcement, release, and ultimate cancellation. I got a lot of positive feedback on this video, so if you haven't seen it yet, then check it out via that card on screen, as well as the other video there if that one looks good too. Also, massive thank you to the names on the right. My Patreon and YouTube channel members make all of this content possible. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching today's episode of Space This Week. If you like the video and want to subscribe, you can click those buttons below. I hope you enjoyed the ride, and I'll see you next time.